If you are like me, you've been horrified by the images you've seen coming out of Israel and Gaza. And reluctantly, you've decided to engage with a difficult topic you've long avoided confronting. Watching a number of videos and reading a handful of articles and coming away with a better understanding of a terribly messy situation. But for all the things I read and watched, one question seemed unanswered. How did Hamas, a militant group intent on Israel's destruction, end up the government in Gaza? So we dove deeper, spending dozens of hours researching this one episode in 2006 that says a lot more than you'd expect about the current conflict. If Hamas won an election, does that mean the Palestinians support them? If they seized power, do the people disapprove of their violence? And if bumbling outsiders like America accidentally propelled them to power, could so much bloodshed have been avoided? Well, let's get into it. The fighting in the Gaza Strip has been going on now for days, and tonight it appears Hamas has won. Before we go any further, I just want to say it really is true that Israel-Palestine has long been one of my personal blind spots. It's complicated, new information comes faster than anyone can verify, and every time it comes up in the media I get such a one-sided picture, it's hard to know what to believe. That's what makes Ground News so useful. The app and website combines articles from all around the world and across the political spectrum with features that help you compare coverage of important topics and see through mainstream narratives. Take this article about fuel shortages in Gaza. Ground News brings together many different publications and shows how left-leaning sources blame Israel's blockade, while right-leaning sources blame Hamas. Moreover, it also shows who owns each publication, giving some crucial insight into their biases. But these features just scratch the surface of what you can learn with Ground News. So if you're like me and need some help making some sense of our chaotic media landscape, visit ground.news slash spectacles to subscribe for less than $1 a month or get 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what we use for unlimited access. Thank you, Ground News. It may be hard to believe that a charity turned paramilitary in the 1980s could, within 20 years, become the government in Gaza and Israel's most feared enemy, but that's exactly how Hamas began during the first intifada, or uprising against Israel. While many desired self-rule and an end to harsh Israeli occupation in the existing territories, Hamas rejected the leading Palestine liberation organization's secularism and growing willingness to negotiate. What Hamas wanted was Israel's destruction. But for now, Hamas wasn't in charge, and in 1993, to their dismay, the Intifada came to an end when the PLO and Israeli government signed the Oslo Accords, granting Palestinians a measure of self-rule in exchange for the PLO's renunciation of violence and acknowledgement of Israel's right to exist. The hope was that the Accords would lead to a two-state solution, Israel for the Israelis and Palestine for the Palestinians. But deep, essential disagreements persisted. Israel rejected the prospect of a Palestinian military alongside other key Palestinian conditions. Most Palestinians supported some form of two-state solution, but they didn't accept Israel's terms. On top of this, Israelis continued settling in the occupied territories, chipping away at Palestinian land while Hamas sought to provoke Israel, with suicide bombings targeting Jewish civilians. In 2000, violence erupted again in the second intifada. Hamas was in their element, firing rockets and conducting suicide bombings. In turn, Israel pursued retribution, imparting incredible violence on the territories and killing countless civilians. In turn, more Palestinians desired retribution, and support for Hamas's radicalism grew as the country's leading party, Fatah, continued negotiating and cooperating 
with the enemy. While Israel gained the upper hand in the conflict, the country's leaders soon recognized the situation in Gaza was becoming untenable. In 2003, they prepared to do something massive. Something that would totally change the dynamic of the conflict and pave the way for Hamas's seizure of power. Though Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon didn't know that yet. You see, Sharon was universally seen as a hardliner, to the core. But in 2003, he offered a radical proposal in Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. Pull out the troops, pull out the settlements, no more occupation. What was Sharon thinking? A later quote from one of his top advisors sheds some light. The significance of the disengagement plan is the freezing of the peace process. And when you freeze that process, you prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state. The Palestinian state, with all that it entails, has been removed indefinitely from our agenda. In 2005, Israeli forces withdrew from Gaza. But it wasn't a step toward Gaza's independence. Rather, according to Sharon's advisor, it was a move to put such discussions indefinitely on ice. For Hamas, however, the withdrawal was seen as a major victory, proof that its bombings and rocket attacks had worked to force Sharon's hand. And as the Second Intifada wound down alongside the Israeli withdrawal, Hamas's message that it could be trusted more than the corrupt and Israel-friendly establishment was resonating with Palestinians. And so Hamas wanted a seat at the political table to run against Fatah in the Palestinian elections, which were demanded by Israel's American allies. Under George W. Bush, the United States believed that Fatah was a shoe in and insisted on Hamas's participation. It wouldn't be seen as fair if they weren't allowed to compete and, hey, democracy means progress. The voters won't support terrorism. The Israelis, meanwhile, were wary and made no promises they'd recognize or work with Hamas if they won. On January 25, 2006, the day of the election, the results were clear. Fatah, divided and corrupt, won only 41% of the vote and 45 of 132 seats in the Palestinian parliament. Hamas, unified and energized, won 44% of the vote and a majority of 75 seats. This wasn't its extraordinary takeover yet, but it was inching closer. Still, Hamas knew that no matter what the vote said, Israel and America, who had espoused support for Palestine's democratic process, would never accept its victory as legitimate. The fight had only just begun. First came the excuses. Fatah insisted that they lost the vote not because of their corruption or inability to manage the situation with Israel successfully. No, the real reason was a bunch of vote-splitting independents. Not far behind came the punishments. After Israel had withdrawn from Gaza, it stayed in control of the border, collecting customs duties on behalf of the Palestinian Authority and forwarding them along. But now, seeing as the Palestinian Authority was headed by a group sworn to annihilate Israel, Tel Aviv said, no way, and began withholding all this money, about $50 million a month. Similarly, the US, EU, UN, and Russia issued a statement telling Hamas essentially, Look, we can't give you guys aid unless you promise not to spend it on rockets. Hamas refused, arguing that renouncing violence against Israel would betray their democratic mandate, even though polls showed most Palestinians favored continued negotiations. But whatever the polls said, suffering deepened in Palestine, particularly Gaza, as Israel's constriction of the economy tightened and tensions rose between Fatah and Hamas, with Palestinian president and leader of Fatah, Mahmoud Abbas, expanding his presidential guard, prompting Hamas to create their own paramilitary force. The U.S. even got involved, training Abbas's men in urban combat techniques, telegraphing a rather hypocritical attempt to reverse the results of the election they had demanded take place. Then came the fighting. After Abbas made a constitutionally dubious attempt to call for new elections in December, Fatah and Hamas supporters clashed, killing at least 33 people between December 2006 and January 2007, until in February, the two sides signed a ceasefire in Mecca, agreeing to form a unity government which took shape by mid-March. For a moment, it seemed as though peace, even a united front, 
might be possible, but this pause on violence was just a calm before the storm. The storm that would mark Fatah's final days in Gaza, before Hamas's total victory. Because by May, the fighting hadn't just resumed, it was worse. In two weeks, more than 50 Palestinians were killed in clashes between Fatah and Hamas. By June, there was no going back. On June 10th, Hamas seized several Fatah members and threw one of them off the top of a 15-story building in Gaza City. Fatah militants responded by killing the imam of the city's great mosque and opening fire on the home of Hamas-aligned Prime Minister Ismail Haniyeh. The next day, Haniyeh's and Abbas's residences each were targeted in further volleys of gunfire and shelling. On the 12th and 13th, Hamas executed a series of assaults on Fatah bases around Gaza. In many cases, they faced negligible resistance, quickly routing Fatah defenders, but in Gaza City, the battle for control of Fatah's headquarters was particularly brutal and drawn out. Still, it wasn't as fierce as the combat in the Tel al hawa neighborhood, which lasted nearly four days before Hamas finally secured victory in the area and gained control of Abbas's residence there. It wasn't until this point, several days into what was obviously an irreconcilable confrontation, that Abbas and Fatah, ever behind the curve throughout Hamas's rise to power, saw fit to disband the so-called unity government and proclaim a state of emergency. By the next day, Fatah had lost Gaza. Its forces were routed, its representatives banished or executed. Hamas wasn't just in charge, they now stood alone in Gaza. The only remaining political factions were similarly radical and largely compliant. Since the battle, there has not been another election in Gaza. It's a tragic story just on its face. The infighting, the civilians suffering in the games played by the powerful, the needlessness of it all. But perhaps more tragic is the tremendous hubris of each actor and the apparent futility of pursuing progress. America, for its part, was certain that democracy would deliver the outcomes it wanted, peace and progress, on its terms. Even as local elections foreshadowed Hamas's triumph, a total failure to realize that, in essence, democracy is a tool that people will use to solve their most pressing problems however they see fit. And futility doesn't even begin to describe Israel's relationship with Hamas, which at every turn was characterized by violence and retribution, which only gave credence to Hamas's radicalism, bolstered its ranks, and brought yet more violence. When Hamas was elected, many were voting in protest of Fatah more than anything else, and opinion polls showed most Palestinians preferred peaceful negotiation to provocative violence. Regardless, after Hamas's seizure of power, Israel responded with a full blockade of Gaza, depriving inhabitants of basic human dignities in an effort to lay siege to Hamas. In turn, recent opinion polls taken just days before Hamas's brutal attacks showed support among Palestinians for a return to violence. It's no surprise then, that violence has begotten violence, that suffering has only allowed Hamas to grow stronger and launch its latest, most violent and far-reaching attack. There may have been a time when both Israeli and Palestinian leadership earnestly desired to reach a peaceful resolution, but now two things are certain. The first is that neither side has any interest in that today. The second is that it's nothing other than a vicious cycle of violence, retribution, radicalization, and yet more violence that has rendered peace, at least for now, essentially inconceivable. 